new roads generate new traffic and that's accepted by Transport for London and would make congestion worse in the area around um, the schemes. Um, and on the far side we have Dr Ian Mudway who is um, an air pollution expert and, and researching at the moment some schools um, in Hackney and Tower Hamlets, some of which are quite close around here where the current northern entrance of the Blackwell Tunnel are. Um, he's from King's College London. So I welcome both my speakers and I will um, go back to John's beginning of John's um, John's uh, session and um, we'll um, have points and questions as we possibly if we go along but let's see how we go um, but there should be lots of time for discussion. Thank you. So, there you are. <laughs> um, good evening. Uh, Jenny has already mentioned East London River Crossing. I led the GLC's objection to East London River Crossing on behalf of Ken Livingston and the then administration. I came back to the same, that was in 1985, came back to the same scheme in uh, 2004, when it was five. Re five, when it was renamed Thames Gateway Bridge, and was part of, I think, a fairly heavyweight objector team, which included uh, Professor Phil Goodwin, yeah. Keith Buck, and John Whiteleg. And we kicked it very firmly into touch, the Thames Gateway Bridge, which was this bridge, the second bridge that Jenny showed at Galleon's Reach, which has been around in London plans since 1943, along its existing line. That's this one. That's a, a sort of schematic of the London plan in 1970, which were planning to build all of those roads as sort of near motorway schemes. And there was an incredibly long inquiry, the Layfield panel, in uh, 1970, 69, 70, 71, that threw it out, and the then Greater London Council, under both administrations, said we could never build it. But that didn't mean that some of those links weren't built. And one of my jobs when at the GLC was I was told that roads generate traffic as a matter of policy, GLC policy, Red Ken and all that, well, central government at that time said traffic will grow regardless, and that's a matter of policy. So it was a head-on collision. Anyway, I, I'm a civil engineer, and civil engineers build roads to try and relieve communities of their traffic. This is common knowledge. Everybody accepts, uh, has accepted it in the past. You build a road, it relieves another road. So having been told by the politicians, I've just come out of Westminster, as some people remember Lady Shirley Porter, and anybody that gave her advice that she didn't like, she tended to sack. And I thought, oh, God, I'm joining the GLC, and I'm told that roads generate traffic. Matter of policy, go away, officer, and do it. But I did have a database. GLC had really good databases. And all these roads were built during the life of the GLC. Not many were promoted by the GLC. Most of them were promoted by the Department of Transport. But that section of the M25, the M11 coming in here, the M1 came down from North Circular, and that section of North Circular has widened. The infamous Westway, which was one of the sections of road in that GLDP map, and the M3A316, and fortunately for us also, the Blackwall Tunnel and its northern and southern approaches. And uh, that scheme developed over the years. It well, didn't all happen at once, because of it was duelled in 68, the Blackwall Tunnel, and went on with other things. Well, the first road I looked at was the infamous Westway. Um, this is the road coming into the end of Maribyrn Road. Do people know where Westway is? Yeah. 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 Anyway, I looked at the Westway corridor, because obviously if roads were leave, one road should have lost traffic to fill up Westway. They used the whole corridor, the roads that were supposed to have been relieved, and the new road. A new road was built there. Yeah, and this is and what happened right. on the whole corridor. And this is <coughs> plotted to 100% of 69, road opened in 1970, traffic volume shot up. This is all day traffic volumes for the first five years and levelled off afterwards. 
because no more could get through even in 24 hours. <laughs> Peak was even sharper. Uh, and uh, just to sort of demonstrate that if you don't build a road, there's very little change. And in fact, these two road corridors are probably less than they were then. And the government had a national road traffic forecast. So when you build a road, you get very much more traffic. And if you don't build a road, you get nothing. Anyway, Blackpool Tunnel, we both had the 24-hour, 12-hour, and a before and after, which is water tight. There's no way people can bypass all these bridges except if they have an amphibious vehicle. <laughs> and noting Blackwall Tunnel, peak northbound increased by over 100% in under a year just between opening and over 100% southbound as well. And if you look at all the others, you lost 100 vehicles there at Tower Bridge. Uh, Dartford Tunnel went down a bit more, so it did provide a minuscule amount of relief, temporarily, in a peak hour, for Dartford Crossing. Uh, interestingly, I don't know what's happened, but there was something in the news earlier this week about TfL meeting with um, the Dartford Council, um, yeah. and they're saying, oh, we want the relief that the, this that new road, good. the Silvertown Tunnel, will provide for, for Dartford. So... That's quite telling uh, and quite worrying that people here will suffer from traffic that should be on the M25. But what can they do? They, if, if, if you do put eight lanes more traffic, theoretically you could get up to 2,000 vehicles per lane of generated traffic. And as you've seen, it generates that traffic. And every single one of those schemes that I studied there's a, reference, there's a link to the website, you can go and pour over it if you like, but every single one showed this really marked generation of traffic. But TfL's case now is they can toll that away a bit difficult on a very few crossings. You can do it area-wide, like the um, Central London Congestion Jug, but doing it on a single crossing... It's going to move in other directions. Well, both the new ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Tower Bridge might get more. or uh, But we'll also get a change in traffic. I live in Canterbury, and I have a lot of reason to go to North West, North London, because I lived there for 30 years. We're not friends or anything. And my son still lives there. So I do drive, but not that often. I'm a sort of classic trip that will say, oh, but less congestion at the Blackpool Tunnel, particularly off-peak, I'm going to drive through London. I'm going to drive more often. And that's the sort of characteristic. So I'll get... And I don't mind paying the toll, because it's a, a part of a much more expensive, longer-distance trip. But if you're going on a short trip, the toll becomes very large. So it's actually going to do exactly the reverse of what the policy is about, to help people short-distance cross-river trips to help regenerate the area of each side of the river. It's going to help people like me, not people like you. So perhaps I shouldn't be here. I should be saying, <laughs> build this road quickly. Anyway, they say they can toll it away. And I've thought about this. It's obviously without models and studies and everything else. You can't get into too much detail. But I've been involved in transport and traffic for a long time. So let's just sort of paint three scenarios. Tolls high enough so there's no increase in traffic up the A2 or up the Blackwall Tunnel approaches. What does that mean? There will be a diversion. There'll be people like me that will change their route. Um, they also say the traffic that's presently in the queue will get through, but then find somewhere else to queue, some nearby, because London works like that. you never solve a congestion problem in London by this method. And that's generally accepted by a lot of academics over the years and people who have studied it at length. So you get negligible benefit for enormous cost of doing it. Traffic gets to the next congestion point quicker and different places for queuing traffic. OK, no queue at Packall. Queue around the corner, queue everywhere else, queue down Trapunga Road. Uh, 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 that's scenario one. And that assumes that there's no generated traffic. That just assumes that what's there just gets through. So, that's, that assumes yeah. that that wouldn't be a single extra journey. So there'd be no, in theory, no benefit. 
because that, you know if the benefit is to have extra trips, then this would would actually yeah. still not even have and any it, benefit. It wouldn't probably have any overall time saving because it'd be just as long queues, <laughs> possibly smaller little bits of queue, but they'll add up to the same length of queue. So enormous cost. I cannot see that happening, but that's zero generated traffic, so the road to theoretically crossing the river are fairly empty. Other extreme, no tolls, and Blackwall Tunnel is presently carrying in the peak direction about just over 3,000 vehicles per hour. So you can have an extra 3,000 vehicles per hour, 3,000, 3,500 vehicles per hour going northbound, an extra about 2,000 going southbound. Uh, new trips, this is this generated traffic I showed you on Westway and Blackwall all day long. And that will be massive congestion across East London, north and south of them. It's not that fast going in the other direction from Blackwall. I know it's queuing all the way as I was coming in. Not stationary, but moving slowly. An extra 2,000 vehicles would mean chaos. Shooters Hill, everything else would be pretty chaotic. So you've got a heck of a lot of extra vehicles, and Ian will... Blanche at the amount of extra pollution you get from all of that. Scenario three, this is somewhere in the middle, and let's say 20 to, 20 to 80% extra traffic. That's if you're going to build the roads and toll, that could be a scenario they target. We don't know, and, but, and I've given a big range. But this still means <coughs> typically. 2, 000, up to 2,000 vehicles more going northbound and 1,000, 1,500 going southbound in the morning peak and obviously the reverse in the rest of the day. And an extra 50, 60,000 vehicles a day going through there causing the pollution, even with the tolls. If you have too high tolls, of course, you're back to this. So those are the potential scenarios. Um, their case, um, uh, obviously, once you get to an inquiry, you can pick it apart. But I've just looked at the documents that you've got, you've seen, or you might have seen. These are, they've got four, <coughs> three cases. Three cases. You know, yes, for, yes and one includes yeah. several other More yeah. river crossings will help our city grow. And this is what they've said. I paraphrased here of quite a big passage. Claims are about reducing road congestion, improving reliability, and the opportunity to, environment, to enhance the environment, access to pedestrians and cyclists. More roads enhancing environment and access to pedestrians and cyclists I find exceedingly difficult. Even if roads relieved, which we know they don't. Um, will it reduce congestion? I don't think so because of the generation traffic. They just haven't done. Will it improve reliability? Probably not, because in fact, it's all going down this narrow corridor, anything goes wrong with the corridor, and you get massive queues. M25 they've widened, now you get six hour queues instead of four hour queues. <laughs> That's improving reliability. More, tra more traffic doesn't help reliability, less traffic helps Big reliability. Big wide roads, when something goes wrong, the rest of the road network just cannot handle it. So it goes but generally, also, more traffic doesn't help, less traffic helps more. Reliability, yeah. yes. If you want reliability, you want to have half-empty roads. OK, you can put, build this Siltown le uh, link and leave it closed, except if it's an emergency. If you could get assurance of all governments that that would happen. Um, you know, well, I am looking at pigs flying around. <laughs> <laughs> no, can, can you go back? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> it's been me up a bit, which is probably right. Um, I would say London has grown very substantially during the last 20 years. It's grown by over a million. I think it's about 1.4 million it's grown by. Do you know? 6.7 oh, to 8.1. So yeah. spot on. No <laughs> one near enough. It's grown by 1.4 million. And it's largely public transport improvements. And public transport improvements have been quite big in the last 20 years. Buses are now reliable everywhere, and it's totally different from my memory uh, of London that I ha have lived in all except the last ten years. Um, and traffic volumes, even in outer London, are now going down. <coughs> They're less now than ten years ago. 
won't say in everywhere in outer London, but they, the, the traffic volume is going down largely by things like congestion charge, massive improvements to public transport, has got people out of the cars and travelling elsewhere. Um, and I've said increased congestion elsewhere won't normally help pedestrians like this. This case, I think, falls apart. I can't see how that case stands up. We can move on to the next one. Though. The second one is, they say it's about improving public transport. It describes intense, extensive, um, that's, I've added that word in because they are extensive improvements to public transport in the area, all the Docklands Light Rail extensions, the Jubilee Line, everything else. Really big changes. And they're saying, but not every journey can be made by public transport. They leave the statement as that, basically. You, you can look at it in the documents, but that is all they say in that statement. And I'm saying a lot has been done for public transport, but a lot has been spent on roads, mainly in a radial direction. Um, there's a route all the way along the south side of the Thames. The A13 has been upgraded, the lower lease. There's a lot of road capacity that's been added in the last 15 years in a radial direction into London. But they haven't succeeded in crossing the river, so that hasn't been much orbital yet. Um, in this sort of statement, what is the real evidence that more road capacity is needed and be helpful at Blackwall, Silvertown, or at Galleons Reach to, to, to this case? And existing roads are still available. It's not that they're being taken away. So I can't really see the validity of that ar ar argument for the second case. So move on. I mean, the point is that that if you do other things with um, the people who don't need to be there, the people that, you know, currently yeah. quite a lot of people who don't need to be there, if you help them not make journeys or make public transport journeys, then That's in the third slide. Is it? Okay, sorry, I forgot that. I forgot that. I thought we had to say that. Um, well, that oh, is, yeah. this That's is true. their case, saying all these bits of public transport <laughs> and the extra capacity at Dartford is this. So road capacity has stayed static, public transport's gone up. That's what they Good. Say. And it's worked. Mm. So the case three is the problems we're trying to solve. Regular long delays at Blackwall Tunnel, particularly during peak times. Fre this is their bullet points. Frequent closures at Blackwall Tunnel, that overhype vehicles and things like that, and maintenance. Need to replace the Woolwich Ferry infrastructure. And the need for additional road connections to support growth. Road <coughs> connections to support growth. That's the one that I haven't seen any, any evidence to that effect. Will it additional road capacity address it? This is my answer. Will it? And I'm saying, I think with enough, with real evidence, it's more likely to exacerbate them by generating extra traffic on the road network with delays, congestion, and pollution in many other places across East London and, and further afield. Mm. A trip like mine will appear as much extra congestion in Hackney and out on the A2. <coughs> Uh, within um, uh, uh, Bexley Barrett. Are there any other real solutions to traffic problems in East London and throughout London? And I'm saying yes, for example, because like, they haven't really studied these. Continuing public transport, pedestrian and cycle improvements. Just carry on the existing policies, which have been <coughs> Why couldn't we have a congestion charge at the M25 boundary? Keep people like me out. Uh, and to complement it, there's railway lines crossing the M25 at, at, at regular intervals. Instead of building an extra lane around the M25, why not lay the same amount of tarmac as a park and ride site so nobody from outside London has to come in? Move around like Londoners have to, by public, or like Londoners find easy one, by, by public transport. And local pedestrian, cycle, and public transport connections across the Thames throughout East London. That could include a replacement for Woolwich Ferry. It could include more river ferries across. Multi-stop, fast ferries, yeah. yeah. That, that cross from one side to the other. Because the main, the main regeneration zones that they're talking about face each other across the river. I mean, you know, 
wild ducks, Greenwich Peninsula, Charles and Riverside, whatever, they're actually facing each other across the river. You don't need four lanes of traffic to, 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 to communicate. Um, and a walking, cycling, public transport only crossing is much cheaper than one that would carry traffic. So there are a mix of things that you could do. Just because we have invested in public transport, it doesn't mean that that isn't the right thing to do more of. And in fact, all the arguments about traffic and uh, congestion generation indicate that it would be... A congestion charge, the M25, simply divert lots of people into driving straight into London to avoid the M25. No, a whole zone inside. L like a congestion charge. London wide, London. London wide road user charging is is something that's been has been uh, looked at. It's been a report that c that could be could be seriously looked at. Yeah. And, uh, it, there are not that many crossings of the M25, so it's physically possible to do. It wouldn't mm. be that complicated. I would say the residents would have some charge when they use it, like they do for the central London congestion charge. But you can have preferential rate for residents of London. Mm. And last one, just to say one. Um, so the schemes and their history, which <laughs> goes back to 1943 anyway. <laughs> uh, traffic generation from new roads, which is real. And it, I found it a surprise. I went away to do that because I was working for Redkin. Uh, mm. And he was right, or his people were right. People like me were wrong. Um, the role of tolls and their possible effect, useful but won't be a cure to them. It can't be made to make it work properly. And TfL's case, which seems very full of holes to my mind, but one thing that we can't get over, why you build a road, won't it relieve the existing roads? And that's quite a shown it actually what happens, but why? You build more road space, surely it'll solve it. But London, there is such an enormous amount of latent, hidden demand for, for travel that you just have to provide a little bit more road space and it fills up instantly. Where it comes from, people make longer journeys, people change to public, from public transport to private and everything else. That's how it works. And people make extra trips. You cannot build the road space in London to solve problems. The only way is try to discourage car use and encourage people to use other modes. Yeah, the, the same lanes of land for public transport as well. Yes. Line, so you can't just say that, yeah, because if you build the public transport, people will use it. Yes. Which yeah. is going to London Overground, the best evidence for that there is. Yeah. Line Victoria is, Line, yeah. Jubilee Line, they fill. Uh, yeah. You get what you build. If you build public transport, make it attractive and affordable, mm. people do that. If you build roads, make that easier, yeah. people do that. So you have to build... Um, and make affordable what you want people to do. Yes. So, you know, that's the reason why it's better to... But you know, the other thing you've got to do is, is, is a sort of long-term planning thing, so you make sure that key amenities and jobs, live, work, uh, proximity are all within easy walking and cycling distance, so you take as many journeys out altogether, you reduce the demand, oh, yes. um, and then you, you provide um, affordable, reliable, safe public transport for the longer journeys that do need to be taken. And all of that will help the car drivers, the van drivers, the lorry drivers, because everybody you can get off um, the existing roads um, who doesn't need to be there, you're making it, um, you know, you're freeing up space for those people who do need to be there. Have to be there. So, I mean, the last thing that the people who do need to be there want is worse, more traffic in the area and worse congestion because, you know, in reality, all that extra traffic has to get to and from <laughs> both ends of the new crossing. You know, the new crossings are only bits of bits of road and all of that extra traffic has to feed in at both ends. Yeah. So, you know, that that is a nightmare for the people who do need to be on it. Is that it, John? Uh, Brilliant. Can I, can I, can I yeah? make my point? Uh, Jenny, what you just said about the, dem the demographics of uh, um, the London, uh, where London's uh, devolved, um, people don't live near their work and so on, so yeah. public transport and uh, road transport yeah. is enormously increased. Um, the long-term solution, surely, is, is uh, as you mentioned, a, a planning solution. Yeah. So that yeah. we have planning applications where they say it's a mixed development. And it means they've got two bedroom flats and four yeah. bedroom flats. <coughs> and a mixed development. There's yeah. no uh, uh, yeah. promotion in the area 
to provide yeah. uh, offices, um, industry, or whatever in, in each area. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's a very important thing, because it doesn't have any uh, 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 deal with the problems we're talking about tonight, but, but it's a Oops. very I in important yeah. social and community yeah. Yeah. Uh, issue that yeah. I think should be taken very, very seriously. And you need so to you have... be thinking about demographics yes. of, of the uh, of people's lives and their, their works as well, uh, this is an offshoot of it. This is a sort of consequence of it. Yeah. Um, so the solution then isn't here, because it's an offshoot. The solution is at the planning stage. Uh, and, and yeah. The development industry <coughs> at the moment uh, uh, in England. Development industry, because we're pretty uh, uh, Is after getting what it can to increase its bottom line in value out of property. And that you need fairly strong planning rules to stop it going in the direction you don't want, in the direction that you're saying it should. Do you not, yeah. first of all, not want just the, the, the strong planning rules? You need the necessity or the impetus for the planning rules. And I very, very rarely hear that. I haven't heard it tonight, except with Jen, you mentioned it. Uh, there, there's, there seems to be no pressure or focus on that. Reducing the need to travel. Yeah. I mean, you know, the London plan does does set these things. Um, well, but the plan, you know, we've all we've all you, you <laughs> know you and I have all struggled to do this. But you know, you, you need um, affordable workplaces. Um, you know, within close distance, you need affordable rents for small businesses. <coughs> you need all of those things. So I'm just saying that there are there are various ways. But you know, you do need to top slice the problem by yeah. making it easy. Um, for people to, to not to have to travel at all and you walk and cycle and then you provide public transport for the, the essential journeys. But you, 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 yeah. you, you, you suggested it in a few sentences, but it's a very, big, very large big, big issue. 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 Yeah. But isn't even recognised, let, be, uh, let alone being... Uh, 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 well, we've got yeah. a problem recently. Uh, sorry, this is off the, well, the roads, but there's yeah. a national planning policy framework uh -huh. which has just been introduced, which... I know, wearing Should another we? hat, I was part yeah. of very strong representations we made. Developers charter you. Yeah. Well, we, there is luckily a, de a, a definition of sustainable development in it after my planning colleague got that in, and that means that you have to do things that help economic growth in a way that also help meet our social goals and means we live within our environmental limits, one of which is air pollution. And here we are. <laughs> here is Dr. Ian Monroe, who's going to tell us why, if these new roads generated traffic, which we have shown they are, um, and traffic, he will tell us, I think, is the main cause of air pollution, and why it's bad for us. Here we are, Dr. Monroe. That's a fantastic segue. Radio 2 or 3, I think, Brilliant. probably. But, um, yeah. I'm going to talk about something simple, just, you know, biology, health and physiology. It doesn't seem nearly as complicated as the behaviour of roads, really, to be quite honest. And I, I work at King's College. I'm in the MRCHPA Centre for Environmental Health. And I've been working probably on air pollution issues now for 15, 20 years. And in this debate, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that there is a health agenda. There are potential victims of increasing the number of roads, the road amount of traffic on our roads, increasing traffic-related pollutants. And many of those individuals don't get a choice in what they're breathing. Yeah. Now, in order to sort of make this point, to illustrate this point, I think it's important, as we're in London, to give some historical context. Because we give some historical context to the story of air pollution and what it can do to our health, there are some important lessons we might need to take on board thinking about pollution now, and how we want our air to be as we go forward in time. Now, this is where we would normally start. If I was students, you're new students, you have to show a picture of Monet's <coughs> sequence of paintings in the background. Here we have, you know, sort of the Houses of Parliament, and he's in London, 1890, painting this wonderful light. But this wonderful light is not wonderful light. It's actually smoke and pollution filling up the city. So London, major mega city of the world, highly polluted. But I want to go further back than that, because to get here today, I had to drive along Evelyn. I didn't drive on the bus along Evelyn Road. Yeah. So you don't have to say to yourself, this is a new issue. John Evelyn, of course, is one of the most famous sons of Deptford, Greenwich, sometimes claiming, occasionally. <laughs> and this is the essay he wrote 
351 years ago. Fumi Fugayan. And in this he made the case to King Charles II that something had to be done about air pollution in London. Not because, as other people have historically said, it was a bit of a nuisance and it smelled and it eroded the quality of life. He said that he thought there was strong enough evidence at that time to say it was bad for the environment, it was bad for individuals' health, and he went on in his planning role, he was a planner <laughs> as well, to say cities should be carefully designed to ensure that the poor, the workers, didn't live cheek and jowl next to the major sites of pollution, the lime kilns, the coke ovens, because it was bad for their health. And, consequently, not only was it a moral issue, it was an economic one, because unhealthy individuals are less productive. So that's 351 years ago. Now, he delivered this pamphlet to Charles II, and Charles II did absolutely nothing. With the evidence in his hand, he only concentrated on what he wanted to do, and he completely ignored it. So this message, okay, is a long time. Now, this is a very different time. We're talking about combustion, the burning of things. Here, of course, we, you know, we're talking about coal, wood. And we can take that forward in time, too. I think, again, if you're giving your talk, you need your next slide. You need this picture, because if you think about air pollution, there are other lessons to learn. If we think about the smogs, which we had in London, this is the famous episode in 1952, December the 4th, cold weather, no wind, people burning coal in their fireplaces, the power stations running at full operation, Bankside, Battersea Power Station, the smoke's released, smoke can't escape from the city. The smoke gets thicker and thicker and thicker. This is not unusual. This is not an unusual story for London at this time. But the politicians don't see any pressure to do anything about it. There's no evidence that anybody should worry about this. This has been going on for years. Then, anecdotes begin to occur. And anecdotes are actually quite useful for scientists because they give us hints of where to look. And these anecdotes began to be correlated in data in the fledgling National Health Service when people began to realise that during this period of time, the oxygen emergency departments were full, the GP surgeries were full. But there were also subtle things about this smog event. During this week in 1952, the undertakers ran out of coffins. The florists in central London ran out of flowers. Livestock at Smithsfield Market for an animal show died. Okay? That was a whole sequence of events, and people subsequently performed the first ever analysis. Now, this is really bad. You don't have anything like this now. The smoke here was so thick, you literally couldn't see your hand in front of your face. They had to have flares in front of the buses so they could follow the roads. But during this week, a subsequent analysis, which was commissioned, discovered about 4,500 people died over the five-day period. Take-home message. Air pollution kills. Okay? Now this was a different time. This was coming from power stations, and so they changed the law. But there were some other lessons here. It took a long time. At the time, Harold Macmillan was the housing minister. Okay? They weren't going to change the law at all. There were other things at play. The country was in recession, so all the good coal was being exported. All the coal for the domestic market was cheap, sulfur-rich fuel, which contributed to the problems. There were lots of things going on. The government didn't have to do anything. They were forced to change the air pollution on a private, private member's bill. But who died? This is a critical question. We can pull up a table now, Professor. Yeah, yeah. This just shows who died, and I split it up into the ages of the individuals. Because if you read the textbooks or somebody talks about this on the television, they'll tell you the very old, the very old died. The very old, very sick individuals died. And actually, we have a word for it. We call it harvesting. It's a terrible word for public health. Okay, harvesting is. Bringing forward the deaths of people who are chronically ill, maybe it's a week or a couple of days. You know, this is the faint final straw, you know, that breaks the candles back. But I just want to illustrate something. Yeah, the very old people died. So this is the number of deaths before, in the week before, and after the event. And there's a threefold increase in mortality for people over the age of 45 years. So it's not quite the very elderly that people think when they have this reported. But this is the important. So this is telling us people who are late, middle-aged, elderly are sensitive to the effects of air pollution. This is a very bad one, but they're sensitive to it. 
The other groups who do not ever get mentioned are at this end. Children, newborn children, children under 12 months. A twofold increase in their mortality rate. So although the pollution we have now is very different, this is telling us that if we're worried about pollution, there are two groups we should be thinking about. The elderly, maybe people pre-existing with spiritual diseases. And down here, the young. And there are many reasons why the young are sensitive to air pollution, and some of them are pretty straightforward, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. They spend more time outdoors. They spend more time doing exercise in the outdoor environment, so they breathe more of the polluted air. Their lungs are immature and growing, so any damage which is delivered to their lungs as they're growing persists and will last for the duration of their lives. So they should be considered in this discussion. Go on to the next slide. Okay. The other thing I wanted to make is this, and again, it's another fantastic illustration. We can use 1952 to make this point. You will hear people, and they will tell you how many people die annually from air pollution. Okay, that's the headline figure. But don't think that's the only burden which is associated with breathing air pollution. Because effectively, it's a health effect pyramid. There will be some people who will die, but beneath that there will be the people who need to go to hospital, the people who have to have maybe relief medications, asthma inhalers. We'll have people attending the doctors, not working. There's a huge and fully costed impact of lost activity economically. It's been done by the European Union. We can tell you how much money air pollution costs you. You can build that into any analysis going forward. And right down at the bottom something which I think we all forget. We all breathe the air and say, we don't get a choice. And we have effects going on in our lungs the whole time. We just don't know them. They're called subclinical effects. Mild inflammation, mild damage to our airways. They're very, very subtle. But over many years, they can begin to cause real changes in your lung function, lung structure, susceptibility to diseases. And it can take 30, 40 years for some of these things to manifest. But they're there. So the air pollution you deliver on people now may have its consequence 20, 30, 40 years downstream, long after the people who had the policy to change something in a negative way have left and moved on to another issue. So it's important we have that. If we take 1952, okay, about 450 people died of that five-day period. If we click the... Hospital admissions rose by 50%, respiratory admissions by 160%. That's huge cost. Okay. Massive cost to the nation. Okay, fine. So, I wanted to show you this, and this was just a point, okay? If you can click a couple of times. I just wanted to give you, there's a sort of a link. This is a lung section taken from an autopsied lung of somebody who actually died of a bronchitic attack in 1952. If you look into his lung, you can see these little areas. And if you magnify them, these really strange areas. This is carbon, this is soot. The particles are actually part of his lung. They've inhaled, they reside within his lungs. And if you section that, you can see all these leg bits. These are inflammatory cells. The, he's breathed the, the, the particulate smoke. His lung's inflamed, it's damaged. And if you look at these, you can actually begin, if you click one more time, see these little dots under electron microscopes? That's metal. Heavy metals which are deposited in the lung. So, something which seems intangible actually is directly depositing and impacting within your lung. At the moment, I'm still only talking about 1952, and clearly we don't have air pollution by 1952. Now, because we have the Clean Air Acts, we stop burning fossil fuels, in the cities, we've bricked up all the fireplaces, we've closed down all the power stations, everything got better. And it's true to say air pollution fell. And the levels now, if you look at them very crudely in just terms of the concentrations of the air, are much lower than they were back in 1952. We just know a lot more about the effects now, many of the subtle effects. Because what really changed, if we go to the next slide, was this. And that's not rocket science. Now, when we talk about traffic pollution, we've been talking about slightly different things. We're talking about gases which are emitted in the exhaust, like nitrogen dioxide, 
nitrogen oxides. Small particles, uh, particulate matter 2.5, particulate matter 10. That's 2.5 microns, an average, or 10 microns an average. To give you an idea, that's about the size of a bacteria. As you get near to a road, near the exhaust, the particles which are emitted are about 100 nanometers. That's about the size of a virus. So what you're looking at are now intangible, almost invisible forms of pollution. The 1952 smogs and the smogs on that time were very tangible. So people felt they might be affecting their health. Now we have something which is much more insidious and invisible. And people therefore perhaps don't give it the due weight when they consider their health effects. Now, many of the vehicles we're concerned about in London are diesel vehicles. I'm sure many of the vehicles which will use the new road will be diesel vehicles because of the increased prevalence of diesel in our roads. And again, here's another message. You may be being told at the moment, we're beginning to realise that diesel vehicles produce toxic particles which are bad for our health. But we knew that in 1950. <clears throat> These are reports from British Medical Journal whole series of them for about 1955, 56, 57. Already people were saying, these, these particles are packed full of dangerous chemicals. We should be concerned about their impact on our health. So there's another message. Sometimes the science is actually a long, long, long way ahead of, if you like, public policy. If you consider that this article here speculates that there could be components of diesel which would be carcinogenic, and it was only really at the tail end of last year that Iraq announced that diesel was now classified as a carcinogen. In fact, some of the compounds of diesel are amongst the most carcinogenic agents which have ever been tested in sort of toxicological studies. So, this is intangible, but potentially has a huge impact on human health. Next slide. It's sort of intangible. I like these pictures because they kind of tell you that it is tangible. It gives you an idea of where we live. This is a picture. We, have a, we run a, a website called London Air in, in our department where you can go and you can find out air quality. And people sometimes send us pictures. We received this at the end of 2011. Somebody in Woolwich was taking a picture from his room. And this is what we would call a fantastic inversion layer. Again, it's they exactly might be like here. 1952. Whoever sent you that picture, they might be here. <laughs> they might be. 1952, <laughs> cold still weather conditions, and you can see this brown line on the horizon. That's nitrogen dioxide. That's the gas coming from the exhausts. And actually, I mean, I live in New Cross, down the road, okay, and so my children go to the school at the top of Telegraph Hill. Every morning I walk them to the top of the hill, I look down over London, and I see that practically, I'd say, 90% of the days that I take my children to school. And what I think is, there are 8.8 .8 million people living in that soup who don't know they're walking around in this thin vapour, okay? Now, once you've got 8.5 million people in that, it doesn't actually have to confer a huge amount of additional risk to have a huge impact on public health in terms of numbers. It only has to affect a small percentage of people when the number of people it's affecting are 8.5 million. Mm. So it's not a small issue at all. Now, one of the reasons I'm sort of interested in this crossing is I've been very interested for a very long time on the effect air pollution, traffic pollution has on the lungs of children growing up in London. And so I've been doing a study around Tower Hamlets, into Hackney actually, and the reason we're here is that demographically this is the youngest population in London. Okay? the most children under 15 years of age. It also demographically happens to be the poorest and most deprived area in the United Kingdom, scores very highly within the European Union. Hackney's the third most deprived area, so you put the two together. Incredibly poor, disadvantaged young people live in this borough. And I'm interested in whether air pollution affects their lungs, because we know from studies which have been published that children who live near traffic seem to have retarded lung growth. Their lungs are slightly smaller. They have this damage which is stored because they've been near traffic pollution. And the other problem is all I've done here is this is picture of Tower Hamlets. Our crossing would be over here. Well, this is, this is the Greenwich Peninsula in yep. the dome, and the Silver Town would be here, and the other one would be just down here. And the traffic would be moving that way once it's all coalesced. 
well, very good. Is that uh, each of these sort of like green areas is a uh, is a house postcode within 100 meters of a major road. Now, in my literature, in my scientific literature, it tells me that if you live within 500 meters of a busy road, it has a detrimental effect on your respiratory health. And every single child living in Tower Hamlets lives within 500 meters of a major road. Okay? So they are not in a good place. They are already, technically speaking, in harm's way, just by chance. This would also apply wherever there is concentration of roads, Newham, Greenwich, Bexley. Bexley. Yeah. I always find it amusing when I go to the schools, because we do our testing in the schools, <coughs> that all the playgrounds, and it's a, you know, it's an accident of London's planning over the years, you see them playing, running around, and they're next to the major roads in their playgrounds. I mean, it's, I find the whole thing quite shocking. Terrifying. And also, not only that, but you have all this high-density housing. This is just around about at the exit of the Blackwall Tunnel, huge numbers of estates, which have almost been designed historically in the 70s, no doubt. You couldn't trap the air pollution which is being emitted from the roads better than you could by designing these particular buildings. And then even more depressing for me is you go up this road and you get all the new builds, which they've built straight slap bang onto the road, and they're advertising for young families. I find that breathtakingly unjoined up, I think, that's and and we know that here there's the Greenwich Millennium Eco Village is just by the southern approach. It's not as high as that, I don't think. That, yeah. but so we go on yeah. a bit more. And this is just to give you an idea. This is a map of London. We produce these in our department the whole time, which we give to government agencies to illustrate that there's very high pollution. We look at NO2 here, and you shouldn't be surprised to imagine the NO2 concentrations. Now, really, okay. around here... This is an annual mean. This is really important, yes? Our limit value as an annual mean for NO2 is about 40 micrograms per meter cubed, yes? Um, that's about a light sort of turquoise to yellow colour. So you can see there are blue areas. That's good. But look around the roads. Completely in non-compliance. That's the Blackwall Tunnel. There. Into the North Circular. And that's the A32. You can see the A2 as well, which comes yeah. up to the black hole. Yeah, all and of that. The, this yeah. road's being developed as well. Yeah, even that's yellow, all of that. Yeah, that would be the other crossing. The south that's side the yeah. So we're there looking at, at lung function. I can't tell you too much about their data because our data has to be peer reviewed and published. But I can tell you, we've already got, we've got indications of very negative impacts on children's spiritual health in relation to their exposure mm -hmm. to traffic related pollutants, which is a collaboration of other studies in the literature, the ones which have been done historically looking at traffic, a recent study which was published showing that there were these impacts also in Scandinavia, where the concentrations are so far below this, there's, they can already see the association in Stockholm. Our concentrations are just so much higher. And traffic is the main source of um, these... This is definitely, there's some, yeah. some yeah. sort of other contributions, but certainly here. I just wanted to make this point because I'm focusing on NO2 because it's a bit of a problem for London, NO2, because we're non-compliant with our EU regulations. These are the monitoring sites which the London Air Quality Network collects its information from. Here we have Greenwich. It does a fantastic job, I have to say, of monitoring its air pollution. Greenwich and Bexley do a really excellent job. But the Red Crosses are, are sites which are in non-compliance with the EU regulations in terms of their annual mean. And you can see that if they're non-compliance now, they definitely aren't going to be in compliance by putting a new road in place. And that, potentially, could have a huge cost implication, because the EU are pretty fed up of the UK not meeting its regulations. And now, I guess, there's the chance that with localism, those costs might just be passed straight down to the local yeah. policies. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I could imagine that happening. It'd be a bit of a nightmare. I'll just point out, that's the Galleon's Reach there, so it's sort of fading all around there, and that's the Blackwell Tunnel again there. Um, so, we're non-compliant already for air pollutants. And you're not allowed, if you're, you, you cannot have an area that is under an EU limit and take it over the EU limit, you know, you cannot exceed where it is, um, you know, if it's currently uh, meeting, meeting limits, um, and you also... Um, you know, you can't worsen it if it's already over, over EU limits, so. Sorry, Xui, could we just go back there a moment? Which of the, which exactly the three areas? Well, three or four areas of Greenwich, which are 
uh, sort of red spots or black spots? Any red spot we cross on it is a monitoring station we operate, which is a non-compliance with the annual requirement for NO2. Yeah, I can't see where they are, though. Ah, well. It, it's the A2, A102 going up northwards. Yep. Yeah. Two um, of them there. Um... Will it fire Well, I can actually help yeah. you. I think the next slide will help you because yeah. actually, because I, I really, oh, yeah. no, no, I'm going to go a bit further back. I'm going to yeah. go to, I'm going to yeah. actually do this not in order because I can answer your question, but I have to go right to the end to this. So what I've done is I've actually taken an annual year's measurements of NO2, mm. Greenwich Trafalgar Road, Greenwich Ooh. Woolwich Flyover, yeah. Greenwich Burridge Grove, Greenwich Plumstead High, High Street. Street. So what you're looking at is this up and down, okay? And we would say that. One of these spikes shouldn't go above 200, that would be quite bad as a short-term average. You see, none of them do. But don't let you believe, don't believe one second that means that 200 is safe. But the annual level should be about here, 40. You go across all of them, and you can see they're often, as an annual mean, they're often above 40 already. So all of the roadside monitors, actually, in Greenwich, are more or less failing. Um, so, you know, you have, that, that's, that's a bit of an issue. Now, does this make any difference. Well, I'm going to go back again in my sort of quick way and just make a point that, you know, you can show that these, breathing this traffic and roads has an effect on your health. This is a study which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, a very good journal, about, well, about five years ago now, where they actually got people with mild and moderate asthma to walk up and down Oxford Street. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Did lots of measurements. Because Oxford Street's just diesel, you see. Only diesel vehicles go up and down Oxford Street. Taxis, buses. And then they made them walk around the round pond in Hyde Park as sort of control. They could do a comparison. What does breathing diesel fumes as you just walk along the road do to your health? Because if it did nothing, we could just go, well, it doesn't matter, really. Actually, we know from the epidemiology it does kill a number of people a year. <laughs> but they had this really interesting okay. data. So, if we go on. This white, oh, what we're measuring here is the amount of air you can blow out of your lung in a second. Forced expiratory volume in one second. The white dots here, what happens is they walk along Hyde Park, it goes down, not massively, and it sort of tumbles along, and by 22 hours it's sort of it's not a million miles away from the mean. This black one's what happens when they walk along Oxford Street. They have this big reduction in their lung function, it stays reduced, and it's still reduced 22 hours. So just breathing the diesel fuse has caused a reaction in their lungs. Their lungs are sort of <coughs> reacting to the, if you like, the irritancy. And the next graph is a bit more complicated. You have to look at, what you're looking at here, just here, is, this is about inflammation. They're looking at inflammation in the upper airways. And just by walking along Oxford Street, you can see this bar here is higher than this bar. This is Hyde Park. This is Oxford Street. So just breathing the diesel fumes has caused an inflammation in their lung, and it's caused a reduction in the lung volume. You, they wouldn't be aware of this change. It's too small to be clinically significant. They certainly wouldn't know they had inflamed airways. They might feel a bit sort of under the weather and a bit sort of fatigued. But these are real effects going on. These are the subclinical effects which go in, on in all of us every day as we walk around London, breathing fumes from traffic. Okay. Just, just to get a picture, Oxford Street's not the busiest road in London by a very, very long way. Yeah. It's carrying typically 1,000 vehicles now. Okay, they're all diesel. The Blackwall Tunnel approaches mm -hmm. are carrying 5,000 vehicles an hour. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. again, this is just increase it by yeah. extra drivers. This is just to emphasise, you know, again, yeah. why children are at, at risk. Um, and mm -hmm. I've just put down some of the evidence here you know, from various papers illustrating that being near traffic has an effect. Now, what I wanted to do was just to make this point. I work in air pollution research. People pay me to do this research, okay? Somebody could say, you have a sort of, even if it's a subconscious, vested interest, okay, <laughs> in bigging up the impact of traffic pollution on people's health because it would, get, it would probably get you a next grant application. Yeah. That would be very, 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 very useful. Now, fortunately for me, I just want to say, take you to this. Oh, this is a fantastic okay. point. Again, I'm going to go a bit further on. Yeah. Here, I want to just go to this. This is really, this is, uh, yeah. I think this is massively important in this debate. Okay? This is a report from January 2010 on the health effects of traffic related pollution on health. There are many of these. 
This is interesting. It's a U.S. report. And why it's interesting is thus. The HEI, the Health Effects Institute, is an independent body. It receives half its money from the U.S. government and half its money from the automobile industry and the petroleum industry and industry in the States in general. It has the requirement that its, ev its synthesis of the evidence has to be legally robust to cross-examination in a court of law. Okay? That's different from the level of scientific evidence where I can say, I think this supports this, and you can say you can never be 100% certain. This document okay, is something you could take to a court and wave in front of people and say, this is a real effect. Now, it was done in 2010. Consequently, it's often a bit too conservative in terms of its interpretation of the evidence, but if it says there's an association, there's an association. Now, I just wanted to give you some of the associations. So if we click a few times, it would be easier. Based on the evidence we have to date, there is completely sufficient evidence to go to a court and say, we know that being exposed to traffic or air pollution derived from traffic is associated with an increase in mortality, predominantly from cardiovascular effects. Not morality. Not morality. As in, <laughs> oh, I always say that. I should change it. Uh, I think it's wonderful. I know. It's good. <laughs> asthma, and respirat asthma and respiratory, asthma onset and prevalence, relation to proximity to traffic. There is sufficient evidence that says proximity to traffic exacerbates asthma. Exacerbation of asthma symptoms in children living near hot spots of traffic related pollution, i.e., where all that traffic filters in when you have all those additional lanes, it is completely sufficient. That sounds very... <coughs> in adults, well, it's suggestive, it's insufficient because not so many studies have been done. But this is saying the evidence for children is completely robust. So, the voiceless individuals in this whole debate, we can say with some certainty, are suffering when they're exposed to traffic pollution and therefore there's no moral argument to exposing them to any more, if you can possibly help it. After all, a bypass, I always understood a bypass, because I come from the country, yes, was something you built around an area so that you would improve that area from traffic and the traffic would get around it. It seems very perverse to have a bypass which you take from Greenwich and run straight through the most disadvantaged area in the United Kingdom where it will have the maximum effect on children. I find that very, very strange. The next slide... Just makes more of the same. Health outcomes. You can go for this. Does it have an effect on lung function? This is about that lung growth. Here it says it was suggestive. If they were to review that evidence today, since 2010, I suspect that wouldn't be suggestive anymore. That would be, we now believe it changes lung structure. And the thing about lung structure is if you change it when you're young, and then your child, you imagine you move from the city to a clean area, there's no evidence that recovers. If you lose an amount of your lung volume when you're young, you've lost that for life. Yes? You can't kind of store that historic damage within your lung. Okay? A bit like if you smoke. If you smoke, it will accelerate the, the rate, almost, it will accelerate sort of like the rate at which your lungs age, effectively. And when you stop smoking, the rate of that loss of function will decrease. It will never recover. You will always have that deficit. Even if you, you know, smoke between 17 and 25, you will have lost an amount of lung function. You ain't going to get it back. Okay? That's it. Your lung's like a repository. It stores the damage that happens to you. If you lose a tooth, you don't grow another. Exactly. But you see it in the skin. You know? You've seen smokers have the skin wrinkles yeah. prematurely. The same thing happens to the lung. The same thing will happen if you're exposed to lots of respiratory irritation. It's kind of like a premature aging. I wanted okay, to give you that. Then I wanted to give you some, just these. Is it an issue, this intangible, invisible? It's not like 1952, but you can quantify it. If we just looked at that mortality figure, which is sufficiently robust to stand up in court, and you quantify that for the United Kingdom population based on 2008, the estimate is the UK population loses on average 340,000 years of life. Now, sometimes that is a very difficult, because that kind of equates, if you just divide it by the average life expectancy of somebody in the United Kingdom, to 29,000 deaths. It's more useful to think that every man, woman and child in the United Kingdom loses about three months of their life expectancy. Only, of course, that's not experienced equally. The people who live in the most polluted areas 
clearly are going to have a bigger hit, a bigger erosion on their life expectancy. And again, that's only expectancy. Their quality of life, their general well-being, that's an even bigger effect. <coughs> and the equivalent figure for, to the 29,000 for the UK in London is 4,000, over 4,000. That was a study done for the GLA. And, and just to back up what you were saying, it, you know, it's often the poorest people who live by the main roads where air pollution is worse. So it is an inequalities thing. If you're adding air pollution, you're worsening inequalities, as well as the most vulnerable. Well, I feel, I, 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 in my study in East London, because we have to go into the schools to do our tests, <coughs> I have to teach their class while my colleagues do all their testing. So I've, over the last four or five years, I've taught about 4,500 children in Tower Hamlets and Hackney. So I've actually experienced and met the very people this scheme is likely to impact the health of. So I kind of feel that. Now, to end with, um, and I can take questions, I found this. This was on the Greenwich Council's website, <laughs> and it's their philosophy about air quality, because they've got a really, you know, they've done a good job. We do regard them in, in our department as being one of the most informed, sort of active, proactive. And it says it here. It says, Greenwich Council is committed to air quality. You know, they're one of the great councils. But then at the bottom, it has their policy on vehicle emissions. I think it's interesting to reiterate this in terms of the discussion. It says, the main air quality problem today is no longer factory pollution, that's true, it's vehicle emissions, that's excellent. This means that we now have to concentrate on pollution monitoring and air quality improvement programs, measurements, that set of aims. Control vehicle emissions at source. Mm -hmm. You've just said it's transport, so you have to control transport. That's absolutely the case. Minimize vehicle use. So you want to take vehicles off the road by encouraging the uptake of cleaner fuels and things, and encourage the uptake of other forms of transport, such as cycling and public transport. I'm not sure that any of those requirements are fulfilled by uh, 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 the proposed schemes. Well, I would, I would say that the Thames Gateway Bridge public inquiry showed that um, if, if that was going, would have gone ahead, this is what the public inquiry inspector said after a year-long deliberations, um, that it would have resulted in fewer people walking and cycling and taking public transport than if, it had, than if it had not been built. And that's when it had separate lanes for walking, separate lanes for cycling. Two of the six lanes were dedicated to public transport. And even so, fewer people would, would have ended up walking and cycling and using public transport, and there would have been more accidents. And I, I, the, the other thing I'd say is I, I, I kind of struggle with the economic argument as well. Just from the experience of spending lots of time in town mm -hmm. hamlets, um, you couldn't, not only is it the poorest area, I don't think you could create a, a, a sort of wealth gradient as steep as the wealth gradient between Canary Wharf and, mm -hmm. and some of the areas in Popular. Mm -hmm. I've seen no evidence in the five years mm -hmm. that I've been there that the wealth has trickled from Canary Wharf mm -hmm. towards that. So the wealth hasn't actually moved just the 100 metres across <laughs> the East Ferry Road. Um, and it just seems to me that what will happen is that people are just going to use this area with all these kids in it as a conduit to get mm. from A to B. Mm. And the people within this area will be the victims of, if you like, other people's convenience. Yeah. And I don't think that's acceptable. Mm. Thank you. Um, well, we'll open it up to questions um, in just a second. I think I'll just sort of... Um, say something because I think a lot of people we're, we're, we're having this meeting um, at the at the sort of closer proximity to um, <coughs> let me just um, go back I'm just going to put up the, the map again um, um, if you'll excuse me one second so we're having the meeting here sort of somewhere down here near, near the, this, this crossing but I just wanted to point out that this area, and, and, and um, Ian's talked a lot about how Tower Hamlets, you know, is, is, is a very deprived borough and Hackney. But also, you know, there's, um, there's a, a lot of issues um, around this, this crossing as well, which is the Galleons Reach. Um, I spent some time um, when, when the Thames Gateway Bridge was being proposed um, around this estate here, Windsor Terrace. A lot of people don't speak English. Um, I went with a woman and her children, it was her children that interpreted um, to the parents, and they had no idea that this four, six, six lane road was going to come right up here past their school, which was there. Um, I also spent some time in 
in Thamesmead. This is also, you know, very deprived. Um, in fact, these two wards closest to the Thames Gateway Bridge, um, it was shown that um, the census then, and I haven't been able to check it now because the ward level hasn't come out, that only a quarter to a third of people in the wards closest to this to the Thames Gateway Bridge had a car. So, you know, only up to a third of people, and yet 94% of all the benefits of this scheme would have gone to road users. And that is, as I say, even when two of the six lanes would have been public transport and having separate walking and cycling. So, you know, to me, this is an issue that very much covers, covers both crossings and both areas, um, both north and south, and both east and west crossings. Um, those benefits are according to the Department of Transport's method of calculating economic return, which are, a lot of my compatriots think are a load of rubbish. The, the, the whole basis, I think, uh, which is that time, tiny bits time, of time, time savings time. to motorists. Yeah. And the, the way they do the sums, um, basic arithmetic says if you've got a small difference in two enormous sums, you're going to have an error. And the whole basis is add up two enormous sums and take the difference. It, and and again, with, with the Thames Gateway Bridge Inquiry, there was a, you know, a year's opportunity for, the, for, the, for Transport for London and the GLA's top people from the GLA economics team to convince the inspector that it was going to do what TfL and the boroughs and the mayor said, which was to help regeneration and create jobs. And his conclusion was that all of those, those claims did not stand up. You know, it wasn't going to do what they said about regeneration at all. In fact, there was absolute question marks about it doing anything. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the regeneration case is, yeah. is very much, um, you know, very, very deep. And as I say, the main regeneration zones, Royal Docks, which is here with the, um, with the airport, Greenwich, Charlton, all of these face each other across the river. You know, um, we and don't... And further down as well. Yeah, and further down. We, you know, parking and... There were much better ways to, 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 to communicate. So um, I think I think hopefully you, you'll agree we've heard you know absolutely why we cannot afford to to increase air pollution and for that reason we cannot afford to increase traffic and and from John how um, actually if you, if you create new road space you are ge generating new traffic um, and worse congestion in the whole area around as all the traffic has to feed in and out. And, you know, if you were going to toll it all out of existence, what would be the point? You could put on tolls now, whether on one crossing, several crossings, London-wide, um, and you wouldn't spend a billion or whatever more um, to, to, to end up with exactly not a single traffic um, journey more than you have now. It would be absolutely pointless. So, let's take some questions. One, two, three, sorry, four, five, okay. <laughs> First five. Yeah. Anne in Hart, I live up on Shooters Hill Road. Yeah. If you look at a, a London Underground map, there's an absolute dearth of uh, connections from um, North Greenwich southwards. There's just nothing there. So um, would it not be so much better to use some of this uh, huge amount of money to um, create extension to the Jubilee Line south and, uh, and to Eltham and beyond? and going east and west as well, and <coughs> maybe extensions to the DNR as well. And there's, uh, just, just look at it, yeah. there's nothing there for yeah. us. I, I, I'll pass it on, but I mean, I, in my response to the, to the consultation last uh, spring, um, I cited several options that are not being looked at, uh, one, one of which is um, um, a DLR extension off the Woolwich loop, up to Thamesmead. That's in the DLR 2020 Horizon study. Um, the case for that didn't look good then, but it was based on having, um, I need to look at it again, but it was based on having the waterfront transits in place, as I understand it. So if they weren't there, actually there'd be a much stronger case for that, that one. Um, Greenwich has also been looking at doing um, a DLR extension following the line of the Blackwall Tunnel here. But if you didn't if you actually took some of this road space that is actually very wide as you lead into the Blackwell Tunnel, maybe maybe there, are, there would be a way that, that that proposal could be improved and made more viable if you actually weren't, not only if you weren't going to put a new road in, but if you actually reallocated some of the approach road to it. So, yes, I think there are lots of different options that are not being looked at. 
um, in terms of, 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 of DLR and, and, other, and other options. Do, yeah. do you have anything to add? I would suggest to TFL they should remove, remove the resources from studying these roads to looking at public transport options and cross-river options for ferry boats and all sorts of things. To, to try and devise a sensible strategy for development of the whole area. Again, all this concentration is where we've already got crossings. There's no, there's no crossings between uh, Barking Reach and uh, and you look at the gap between the Woolwich Ferry and, uh, and Dart Crossing, it's enormous. Mm. If you want to provide... Lots of other... Lots How can we get TFL to do that? Well, we're trying, we're having a meeting now. <laughs> we're all going to, maybe, <laughs> uh, put in our responses. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to... The old roads never die, or almost never die. And I think this is one of the problems. Uh, you've probably all heard of Archway Road. I think that one's dead now, but the... Very, Other one. They keep coming back. Well, as yeah. Barry, who's in the back of the hall here, he was fighting the East London River Crossing, which we <laughs> talked about. Um, um, so we've got, you know, absolute memory of, of, of that one. Um, and then, as I say, when it became the Thames Gateway Bridge, um, others of us sort of um, joined in. Um, but, you know, they keep coming back. And they're always, they're, always, they're always sort of like a, I don't know, a decade behind. If they'd come up with the scheme for the Thames Gateway Bridge when Barry was fighting the East London River Crossing, they might have got away with it because it was public transport sort of part then. But now, you know, um, you know, things uh, have moved on. So we better... Uh, yeah. Your, your compatriots in Transport 2000 campaign... Better transport. They commissioned me in 2002-03 to look at the, the case that they were putting up then for the Thames Gateway Bridge. And uh, I coined... I'm not in the publicity business at all. I'm an engineer who doesn't think of words. And mm -hmm. called it a solution, a solution looking for a problem was what the title the title of the report. Yeah. And the reasons the road keep on changing to try and justify this old yeah. chestnut road scheme. Yeah. yeah. Um, question two, the gentleman in front in the in the sweater there. Your question. My question. Yes. Um, I didn't think the morality and mortality was a mystery. No, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you're right, yes. Actually, I'm just going to ask, I hesitate to mention the dirty word like lawyer to you, but if I was a mother with an asthmatic child living next door for one of these uh, blighted spots, posting the Health Effects Institute data, uh, you're suggesting I have sufficient evidence to sue, what, TFL, local council, make a quick buck? Well, I don't think you would go that way. Now, but on the strength of that evidence, there are organisations like Client Earth who are fighting the battle where it needs to be fought. Yeah. So if you bring it, if you, the problem with air pollution and all these issues is if you bring it down to the individual, then nothing will happen. Because every individual has a slightly inconsistent and... and so, yeah, case uh, class, class, class action! Class Client action! Client Earth are <laughs> fighting in Europe to ensure that our government has to honour its European commitments for air quality standards. Well, they know too. And yeah. also to prevent politicians from lobbying actively at this present moment in time too. to have certain standards which are inconvenient and they cannot meet from being removed. We, the very last day we're supposed to meet our NO2 limits, it was supposed to be 2010, it was possible to get an extension to 2015 if you asked the government, uh, if you asked the EU, and you showed um, how you were going to meet it by 2015. Yeah. Now, the government didn't even bother to ask for an extension for London, as well as 15 other zones like Manchester and whatever, because they don't expect London to meet the NO2 standard for 10 years after even the most extended deadline, in other words, till 2025. So they haven't even asked because they can't, they're not prepared to take a bold enough action to show how it could be met um, by 2025. So, um, 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 so, gentlemen behind. Thank you. Um, I'm David Gardner, I'm chair of Greenwich Village Labour Party and chair of the Chancellor Society. Oh. Um, and both of those organisations are fairly neutral on, on the issue, um, but we want to see more evidence. So tonight is, is, uh, is uh, very useful to that extent. Uh, evidence on the traffic, environmental, economic, and obviously the health impacts uh, of the proposals in the basis of looking at different options, including public transport <coughs> options. So that's the view that both those organisations take. Um, 
that um, what is put forward by uh, there are two issues I want to raise actually put forward by proponents uh, of the uh, of, of the schemes. So just to act slightly as devil's advocate, although that's not actually where my personal sympathies lie. Um, firstly, it's put forward by some, and this is a real issue about. Um, the ability of local businesses, of which we have been very successful local businesses, to service uh, businesses and others um, in Canary Wharf, the Royal Docks, North of the River, and the current uh, congestion, delay, and costs they have to suffer as a result, and the market opportunities that uh, limits for them, which has an impact on jobs and, and, and so forth. So now, I, I just think that. Any solution that we have has to deal with that issue of those that have to use uh, commercial vehicles of one kind or another, how it's easier for them to get over the river. I don't believe personally for a moment that private vehicles generally need to get over the river, only in mm. exceptional circumstances, mm. um, only if you encourage them. But, uh, so that, that's one issue, and I think that that's a strong argument put forward by proponents, and we need to address that argument. Um, the second issue which is put to me, and I've got an air quality map locally, so I follow what King's College Air Quality Network does uh, quite, uh, and I live on a road which is uh, well above the EU uh, standards, so I have a personal interest in this. Um, but what is put forward by proponents of others is, of course, with electric vehicles and much better emissions and so forth, the new vehicles coming on stream, uh, that... Uh, Air, the, the air quality issues will be reduced over time. And I wondered, A, is there any evidence that air quality is improving uh, as people get electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles and so forth? And B, what are the best academic um, forecasts of what that impact will be? And I've certainly heard it said, well, it, there's a slight short-term problem there, but by the time this thing is built, everyone will be driving electric cars, hydrogen cars, anyway. So it would be useful to get your uh, your views on that. So I, so I stop. If, you know, I'm, not an, I'm not an economist, yes? Beyond the fact that any costing for economic impact or benefits within an area should have a health impact assessment alongside it so that the relative costs and benefits <coughs> are fully understood. Because otherwise the benefits go to the few at the penalty of, of the many. But I completely understand, you know, the fact that you may open up a corridor, the corridor's already there, so there may be other traffic solutions which more adequately deal with that issue in terms of that. The issue about technology is an interesting one. You know, air pollution did fall, you know, until about, I would say, 1998, and it's been very static since then. And in fact, certain pollutants have actually started going up. And that's because the technological fixes don't work. If we had electric cars and they were very you know, penetrant within the, the, the fleet, maybe. But the emission standards on diesels do not do in the real world, do not fulfill the emissions in the real world that they are meant to on their test beds. And this is known at every level of every intervention, WHO, EU, government. We know the test cycle results for diesel vehicles do not work. What about hybrids? Hybrids, if you can. We know, for example, at the moment today, there's been some really interesting information in the news about diesel vehicles and hybrids coming under that. It's a very difficult policy which has been announced today that you know, the Prius and diesel vehicles are going to come under the congestion charge because they want to reduce the total CO2 emissions. Um, and I can't see what the Prius is there, to be quite honest. But I wonder if there's a second objective, which is actually they know they've got to do something about diesel vehicles. Mm -hmm. Because diesel vehicles, the penetrance of diesel vehicles is increasing dramatically. Our fleet is more and more dieselized. And actually we know they're a real problem. The gas and the engines are actually pretty good. They meet their Euro class emission standards. The diesels simply do not meet their standards. And I know people who've measured <coughs> their emissions in the world, real world as they drive around London who have literally been blown away by their data. There was a Mercedes-type car which went past, which was a new one, which was producing about the same amount of knots as a London bus. So it isn't producing, okay, what it's meant to do. But specifically, it's the diesels. I think that that's a kind of like a bit of a massaging 
to mm. get to diesels mm. without feeling as though you're persecuting diesel drivers too much because diesels have been so avidly promoted in mm. uh, the last 10 years. I think it, so the technology yeah. will not fix it. Yeah. I would say confidently with all the technology coming online, in 10 years' time, we would still be sitting here with your map. Mm. And it would look very similar. And your colleague, um, Professor Frank Kelly, told the Environmental Audit Committee, um, the government's Environmental Audit Committee, that, you know, as well as, obviously, Technifix, he didn't say that, but um, the, the next bit, um, he basically said that we had to cut traffic levels by about 20 to 30 percent in London to meet our EU limits. So it is absolutely agreed that we actually have to cut, you know, traffic levels as well as do the techno fix. So, you know, so to my mind, if we were if we were meeting our EU limits and there was like some literally sort of breathing space, then you could consider, you know, adding to traffic. But we are already way over. We cannot afford to a increase more. And in fact, we've got to reduce it. So, you know, the last thing you do is make it harder. Why generate a load more traffic? You have to control and, and try and bring down when we're not even taking the political steps and, and actions necessary now to, you know, we know we're over now, we know we've got too much traffic, and we're not prepared to take the actions necessary to control what we have got. So, I... And, and, Can and, I do... Yeah. do uh, as far as sort of getting the commercial traffic, which is a big plank of all of this, you've only got to get rid of sort of 30% of the cars from the road network, and you've got plenty of space for all the essential commercial traffic you've got. Um, go so far, uh, add to all the figures, that the motor manufacturers are now producing for their NO2, for their CO2, are quite well rigged. Um, all the various tests have shown these for massive improvements in economy. They're false. A, a, a 2000 car is probably just as economical as a 2012 car. Yeah. Okay. Is that, is that you so more or less... Do, do, was there any, any other sort of big points you don't think have been addressed, David, or...? Mm. No, 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 no. You think that's yeah, sort of, sort of, sort of answered? Yeah, no, no. I just can't remember whether several aspects it's of it. Very important. Yeah. One, and no, it's no. It's very I mean, that's why you're making, you're making arguments uh, about the uh, crossings. It's important to be cognizant of those. Yeah. 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 Those and that's. We can't be seen to be. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was saying earlier. That you know. Just because we've invested a lot in public transport, that doesn't mean that that isn't the answer to do more of it. And that that is a way of you are actually helping the the, the, the essential vehicle journeys by investing in public transport. You know, we know yeah. congestion charge, and we know public transport improvements work, and we actually know that road enlargements don't work. Yeah. Now, who was next? Um, I know you had one, and then was there something? And I can see you now. And was a gentleman there? Oh, you pointed to him. I, and and, and uh, um, I, I did see, I saw you right at the beginning, so I'll just take you and then we'll come over this side. Yeah. Um, oh, it's still okay. It's more yeah. of a, a point than a question, but a large part of the proposals is to actually remove the Woolwich Ferry mm. uh, and send all the traffic, and there's actually a lot of traffic that does use that, mm. and divert most of that to the proposed Silvertown Tunnel, which both. is uh, with all the traffic. So that's extra traffic in addition to that and all the pollution that that brings. And uh, reducing the connectivity to Woolwich, yes. which is, isn't the most, it's not the most deprived, but it's not exactly thriving. And connecting that to the more deprived newer. Um, and I just don't see what, well, yeah, it's important to recognise that they want to remove that. Yes. And I don't see how that correlates with what their state aims are. Yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of people here, it's a, you know, a big, big centre, a lot of people rely on it. There are some queuing and traffic problems here, but more could be done. They say it's ageing, it would have to be replaced anyway. Yeah. It could be replaced anyway with, yeah. with better boats. Um, they would, they say that they would close it. It's like the River Crossing inquiry in 1985. Yes. And it's still yeah. going. Yeah, it can, it can be replaced. The idea is that you would, they would put it here. But if you put a ferry here, um, basically... You know, that is a Trojan horse for a Thames Gateway Bridge. Um, and if it starts off at four lanes, um, you know, we build all the infrastructure. And there's, you know, there's fewer, fewer people here. 
this, if anything, should be, in my view, a walking, cycling, and public transport yes. only. If you ever see. look at uh, the Trojan horse type argument, that is an all circular. That's an all circular, and then so, the M11 is yeah. up there. That's the A30. Yeah. So I it mean, produces another strategic route across the The Thames yeah. Gateway Bridge was going to cut straight into that big roundabout. Yeah. And, and they say that the, a bridge instead of a ferry here wouldn't have the same sort of what they call grade separated links as the Thames Gateway Bridge would. But you know, if they if they've got something there, chances are it would all could yeah, all be I added to. That yeah. Jams, okay, right. gentlemen here. Yes. Given given everything you you said mm -hmm. so far, is there anywhere between Blackwall and Dartford where you think it is sensible to have a crossing, perhaps restricted to local traffic for roads? It hasn't been studied, but I would always go for public transport mm. and foot and bicycle first. Yeah. And there's a lot of area where there aren't any such crossings. Um, the, the argument between West London and East London, the West London is little bridges with you know, one lane of traffic in each direction, one lane of buses in each direction. The, these aren't, these are four and six lane roads linked to major roads. Mm. Different character. Yeah. It, it would be given the different geography of the area. It's, it's expensive. expensive. It, it's much easier, much cheaper to carry the same number of people in a ferry boat or a... Or a, or a and a, and a, it's a, never a, anything other than railway. strategic. If you yeah. build a new road across an estuary, it can't ever be unstra you know, yeah. unstrategic. And, and if is... you've got to get across the, the shipping lanes of various sorts, uh, you've got to go high or you have a lift bridge or a ferry. <laughs> Yeah. Ferry. Perhaps you have both ferries. But, yeah. but yeah. design so you can never turn that one into a road. But yeah. at the moment they're saying, well, well, we'll have a road in reserve. So the road is there. But the council to wants to put a bridge there, not a ferry. Yeah, 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 yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that, that, that initially yes. proposes a, as a, a Trojan horse. Uh, as, a, as a ferry, but they are now putting that as an option for a bridge. But I mean, the point is. You know, we have to we have to live within our environmental limits, and that's you know, we you know, and and we cannot we have to meet we must for health reasons, for morality reasons, and mortality reasons we have to meet our, with our, our air pollution all those limits. On the head, so, you've still yeah. got the congestion argument. Yeah, yeah. So, and you can't solve by road. And it, if it, for all electric cars, yeah, you'll still have. The and you've still got severance and accidents and. Well, you've actually you've got bre broken tyre wear. I mean, the, the, you've made a point before <laughs> that emissions out of the tailpipe of a car is one thing, but actually all vehicles also generate particulates through the, the wear of broken and tyre particles. Now, sorry, a few others I saw. Was it Dell? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then, sorry, was there a gentleman over there and Barry at the back, Philip? And Okay, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> uh, Dell Del Brennan Regional Network and London Waterways Commission. Um, I was going to say something that uh, wasn't said uh, earlier about ferries, and there you are com coming up with suggestions of ferries, uh, because they are, uh, as you say, very cheap, very adaptable, all different shapes and sizes, and they can be put at more or less uh, any uh, a, a great variety of destinations mm -hmm. all the way down the west of the uh, estuary. Yeah. Uh, cross ferries, we've got the fast ferries, We've got the Clipper. British Ferry, but the opportunity for all sorts of yeah. ferries. Yeah. If you look on uh, old maps, you'll see dotted lines, which in the countryside dotted lines designate a, a path, footpath, and you'll see them crisscrossing the, all the way down the estuary to the wide estuary as well. Yeah. And in fact, those are uh, uh, in fact right away yeah. because they're footpaths in, uh, in the same uh, designation as a uh, right away, and they've all been closed except one, which is still going uh, part time at Dagenham. Right, so yes, the, that's right, yes. Yeah. And you, you can put those in and link them with transport system, public transport systems each side of the town. Very, very, very readily, because they're yeah. very adaptable. And more, so they can be changed, very cheap. They can be taken away, or yeah. doubled, Adapted. or improved, and yeah. so very versatile. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing that I am concerned about is the water lobby, which includes myself, <laughs> isn't promoting uh, water transport yeah. sufficiently. Yeah. Uh, and I think we fall down very badly on that. Now that brings me to one other larger subject. Briefly, yeah. Yes, sorry, briefly. Is, is that we were talking all the time about blaming government. I wonder where the blame really does uh, also lie. Mm. Because blame the gov government, they come up with policies and things like that, but that devolves down through the community and, and mm. so on. And, and I think there are a lot of other groups, agencies, individuals under that 
that uh, are, are also um, responsible for the, the situation. And how do we identify it, first of all, and in that case... Uh, well, I think we, we need a, you know, there needs to be a proper bottom-up, proper look at I've really what, what do we, what yeah. do we, you know, where, where do people want to go, what, you know, what are the, what are the real options and package of options that, you know, that haven't frankly been looked at adequately, um, and, and, and what are the different ways to solve it. Okay. Um, and land use together yeah, with together. transport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, my, I know I, 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 there was somebody else before Philip, was it? Um, there was this gentleman there, thank you for reminding me, I apologise, I'm not a very experienced being, chair. I'm being a moderately shy over here. No. Um, Ian Bloor, I live around the corner, um, and really I'm playing the devil's advocate again. Um, I've heard a lot of the arguments from TfL that traffic easing will overcome any additional congestion mm. at a, what we all call a third blackboard tunnel. Um, and, and we have to look at the balance between increased but smoother traffic, uh, because it's idling and um, congested traffic that cause most of the movements. How does that argument stack up? Um, the TfL has its models which predict traffic. Um, I go, I, I've got no confidence in models on their own. Uh, I know during Thames Gateway Bridge they were saying 30% of the traffic on Thames Gateway Bridge would be generated. The other 60 to 70% was diverted off other crossings. <coughs> the evidence you've seen today is 99% is generated, 1% <coughs> might come off other crossings, and that's in fairly short time. So I take models with a pinch of salt. I, uh, those arguments I don't think stand up on evidence. All the models are all predicted this way, but we know that if you build a new facility, we get a lot of extra, whether it's a tube line or a, or a, or a road in London, the markets, there's so much latent demand to fill up. And you get new points of congestion. Yeah. Maybe a very long queue at Blackwall at the moment. One of the reasons you've got a long queue at Blackwall is there's no congestion at all coming in. The Blackwall Tunnel is the first pinch point from the M25. Everywhere else in London, you'll get a load of pinch points. So again, congestion all the way down. You never sort out congestion problems in London without reducing traffic. That's 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 a very important message. I mean, I think you know we 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 did sort of cover this. You know, if you unless you literally told away any new journeys, which they're never going to do because what's the point? Um, you are going to generate traffic, and if you generate traffic, as John says you are going to have more congestion around, you know, so that's that is... We yeah. generate traffic. It's being there all the time. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. One of the points I was... I'm driven driven that's because we yeah. are it's the we... nation's demand. That's the problem. We change it's... our travel. <laughs> yeah, no, so that's the, the principle of generated traffic is that new journeys are made that otherwise wouldn't because if you make it easy to drive, new journeys are made that wouldn't previously, just as if you build public transport new journeys are made by public transport if it suddenly becomes easier or more, more convenient, uh, cheaper you will do it when you wouldn't before and just to remind you that the Thames Gateway Bridge Inspector, another thing he said mm. is that it was likely to cause increased congestion so that was, the, this scheme was going to, likely to cause increased congestion and that is you know, that is not going to solve the bigger overall congestion problem, as John's just said. I think Silvertown is worse than this one. If it can be worse, I think it's worse than that. <laughs> Terrible twins, yes. Yeah. Apart from the fact that, you know, you, I'm, you definitely would get some relief for about a couple of months before the, it logged up, so they'd be able to say that it did work for a period of time. The other thing was about public accountability, and it just reminded me again of something we had on our blog. At the moment, we say to people... Air pollution is difficult to avoid, but you can tell people it's high and you can get people to change their lifestyle. So government now will send people information and say air pollution is very high. You should consider what you do in the outdoor environment. If you have asthma, you should consider when you go out. And somebody sent us a little email and mm -hmm. said, why don't they tell people to stop driving their cars? <laughs> and you suddenly go, ah, hang on. <laughs> yes, because the onus is put on the person who's the victim, not on the polluter. Very good so point. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, gentleman there, and then Philip, and then Barry. Uh, thank you, Raj. Councillor John Fly from uh, Greenwich. 
And uh, I just want to make two points, a couple of points for you. First of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, of organising the meeting. Uh, I feel more informed tonight than I was last night uh, on the whole issues around health and, and all of that. That's very important. But we continue, I think, uh, to face a dilemma. Uh, the point raised earlier about the, uh, the underground map, I think, is a very important and powerful point. Uh, if we got public transport right, it would be economically viable for more people to use it. Uh, if there was joined up thinking in London, as there is in Paris and many other European cities, uh, and it was more cost effective, then the demand for uh, cars uh, and car use would be uh, less, hopefully. Uh, but I guess uh, that's about how people manage their own affairs. But bearing in mind that uh, I think that David pointed out of the uh, amount uh, or the increased population in London uh, that's growing and will grow in future years. And so therefore the demand on cars uh, will become greater, I suspect. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but in effect, um, bearing in mind that uh, in the argument being pursued currently by TfL, by others, is that there are more bridges in West London yeah. than there are in East London, well. <laughs> and so therefore, uh, and so therefore, uh, the capacity issues or the pressures in terms of uh, traffic in the log jam uh, in East London is much worse than West London. And arising from that, really, could I, could I ask both of you? Um, from the surveys that you've both done in terms of pollution and road traffic, um, is it better to have more bridges or less bridges? Um, and are people in West London faring better in terms of pollution uh, than we are for what seems to be the case uh, that you presented this evening? I can only really talk about pollution and health. I can tell you that the people in West London are not faring terribly better than the people in East London when it comes to air pollution. There is an interesting argument to be made though. Um, if you take something like Putney High Street, very high NO2 levels, sky high, big, big actions have been taken, the government's involved, the local government's involved, barristers and wealthy people in Putney are complaining about it, something's happening. East London not the same. East London seems to suffer. West London has this problem. It's the same cause, traffic, but people are addressing it. But in East London, they're not addressing it. In fact, they're trying to make it worse. Um, so, does do bridges? I can ask because I can tell you that the more traffic you have, the more negative health indicators you are going to have in your resident population. I would say that the people who live certainly north of the river, who have more experience with New York and Tower Hamlet's Hackney, really don't need anything else to be delivered upon them than they already have in terms of a, you know, an indicator, that, in terms of their deprivation, in terms of the exposures they already have. Um, so they already are disadvantaged. So even if you were to take the West London argument, you're not comparing like with like. Because the populations are so profoundly different in terms of their levels of deprivation. I'll go, go a bit further. The roads in East London tend to be big, wide roads, very heavy corridors of pollution. The A13, the South Bank route, the A2, Blackwall Tunnel, Dartford Crossing, the, the North Circular. They're all big roads with much higher levels of pollution because much higher flows than Albert Bridge or Battersea Bridge or Hammersmith Bridge or any of those crossings. But those bridges are all old, fully uh, costed out. They're at ground level, they link the two sides. Linking East London is not the same, uh, the same it, it's a different order. You can't actually transpose East London to West London, uh, West London to East London. The Thames is wider. Where do you stop building a crossing? From Ramsgate to Felix there? Because at some stage you can't get a, put any more crossings a, a, across. So. Mm. But we can, if we want to link the two sides, have good public transport down each side, ferry boats, or 
a few more crossings of things like DLR, which will carry a lot more people. And you can pull bore little holes under the Thames, which is a lot cheaper than building six-lane elevated roads 100 feet up in the sky. And I think the, um, you know, the argument that I would say is that the more there is an issue about population growth, the more there is projected to be more demand, the more important it is we don't invest in roads and, 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 and make it easy for those people to drive, the more important it is to do the opposite and invest in public transport. So you try and capture those extra trips, that extra demand in public transport and not in roads. So the more the argument is that there's, 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 there's growth in jobs and, and, and population, the more I say we've got to go down public transport. And we've been very successful for the 1.4 million London's increased. Yeah, so we've done it and there is less traffic. And we've been investing in public transport, so it works. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I would say, you know, as you say, I mean, can you imagine Putney, um, Putney's reaction to a six-lane um, <laughs> road coming through them um, or, you know, hitting, channeling traffic into... demonstrates the other argument. We've got to have these roads to help business. If you see the pros you did a correlation between prosperous areas of London and road Ooh, space. Yeah. Putney's very rich, Hampstead's very rich, Cricklewood's pretty poor. So you don't have to just go to And Europe. actually there's something else. The Mayor's economic development strategy. Um, there's a there's a um, a table in there which is the attractiveness of London to business and it rates London really highly among European capitals, like one, two, one, one, one. And there are two things that London is really rated badly for. It's like 28th out of whatever, I don't know, not that many more European cities. And one of them is freedom from pollution. The other one, I think, was cost of living, yeah. um, cost of housing. But, it, you know, business doesn't like poor air. You know, nobody wants to live or work or visit in a, in a, in a, in a dirty environment. Sorry. There's one observation on that, which is the... British Council with its British the Gap campaign, um, the firms that are backing it are almost all construction companies, house development companies. You have a firm that promised to cruise by the by the Olympics and didn't deliver. You know, they're all they're all firms that have got a direct interest in this, apart from the, the O2 Arena. And the only reason that the Greenwich Peninsula was developed was not because they built the Blackwall Tunnel. If, if roads were so good at regeneration, wouldn't the well, Mary should know. Wouldn't 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 the Greenwich Peninsula have been fantastically developed um, and prosperous years ago? <laughs> yeah, 1968. But it was actually when the and it was, this was not a, a, um, um, a millennium legacy, but it was when British Gas, um, I think they paid 20 million towards the... Towards the uh, well, anyway, I thought it was 20 million towards having the Jubilee Line station coming through there. And that's what made the difference. That's what made the difference. Anyway, um, Philip, um, and then I think, and, and Barry. Um, and then we'll, yeah, see how we do. Philip Connolly, Great Interactions to Stop Pollution. Um, this proposed scheme is, is, is that uh, listed is costing six hundred million. Now I would I would suggest we ought to think about if that's ring fence money for uh, uh, for strategic importance for regeneration. We ought to think a little bit about what else that could pay for. Um, we could actually one of the problems we've got in in our part of East London is the quality of education in our schools and the performance of our schools. We could do a lot to address that. We've got a dearth of jobs in some parts of the borough. We could do a lot to address that. The point here is that transport ought not to be seen as a primary goal in its own right. It's a secondary goal, or even lower goal, to serve other other um, other kind of um, objectives: health, sustainable communities, regeneration that's sustainable. Those we seem to be serving those goals. So, I would suggest that the council ought to now show leadership on this issue. We ought to be talking now about the politics of this issue. I think the arguments are very clear. Why, after so many years of making these arguments, have our council still supporting this scheme or schemes like this? We ought to be demanding something better from our councils by now. 
and I look to the councils in the room to give us assurances that they're not going to happen. I've been fighting this for over 20 years, many people in this room for 30 or 40 years. It's time we got better leadership from our council. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Barry. Thank you. Um, I think there's someone who has been fighting this for 30 years. My name is Barry Gray. I'm the uh, uh, former chair of the People Against the Real Process. <laughs> and this is where my day job is now and then uh, it's often required for medicine at King's College Hospital. Not quite the same as the person with Dr. Mudley. We've uh, been separated for 100 years, but I've been happily but now reunited, so we've been seeing a little more of one another. <laughs> I mean, I've been hearing these arguments since 1982. Uh, we're told at the east side of the river crossing that London won't grow without the river crossing. Now we're told it's grown by 1.2 million, uh, million people. We need a road uh, to sort that out. Um, we're told that roads bring prosperity. But why isn't Bow and, uh, and Poplar uh, as rich as Chelsea. Bow and Poplar are in environmental hellholes because of roads. Chelsea's not. It's got a tiny little bridge leading to it. These things just never stuck up. When these things were fully tested at the Thames Gateway Bridge Inquiry, um, after sitting for, two, for 12 months, <coughs> 200 sitting days, um, the inspector, an experienced inspector, advised by Mr. Watson, who is his assistant, who is a traffic modeler, um, said none of the arguments advanced by TfL were stuck up then, they don't stack up now. He actually said that TfL's traffic model, which everything else has built, the environmental case, the health case, he said the model uh, lacked robustness. Um, no, what did he say? Yeah, it, it was a, generally not credible, lacked robustness, which is his polite way, he's a very polite man, he's an MA at Oxford, um, very polite man, he said <laughs> rubbish. Uh, <laughs> I believe uh, it's rubbish now. Um, I was in a meeting three days ago when I actually heard the leader of British Council on the subject of federal leadership admit the astonishing fact that the recent campaign, British Adapt campaign, wasn't based on any research. It wasn't based on any evidence. It was based on jingoism passed on from Transport for London and the development. Um, it just seems to me that that is a very, very poor quality of leadership. He did say, John, you were chairing a meeting. <laughs> yeah, I know you disagree with me. Everyone gasped at the meeting when I asked him what the evidence was. He said, There isn't. You don't need it. Um, so, um, just to uh, uh, bring those points um, together, we'll disagree with John on that. We'll just want to be in the meeting, but uh, uh, we'll see. Um, these, the one thing, last thing I'd ask you to do children's lungs in Plumstead and Thames are just as sensitive as those in Western Park and Blackheath. So don't over-focus as local blogs and reports have done on the Silver Town crossing. Yeah. The people uh, in the east of the borough are saying we don't want any more crossing, we don't want any more big roads in the Big roads kill people, they don't bring development, they bring more traffic. So if it's not good enough for Silver Town, it's not good enough for Thames right? So yeah. um, I want you to adopt, uh, and when I read in the 853 uh, uh, this is not a campaign, so this is a a shiver went down my back. We spent 30 years in the Eastern Bar saying we don't want more capacity platform, we don't want to bring So let's be united on this because the common trick of transport for London will verify to divide the opposition and take them all one by one. Don't let them build that. Let's stay united. This is a, these are a bad set of schemes. And they were bad in 1983 when they were first proposed. And they're, you know, there's no real evidence that they're going to make any, uh, any impact which will benefit anyone. Uh, in these areas, as Dr. Mugway has said, people who live within two or three hundred metres of major roads exposed to these ultra fine parts, and they're generally poor of people, and if we would look to this council to be protective of the normal circumstances, vulnerable people uh, are the ones who are going to suffer most. And also, the children yeah. across lots of roads to get to school, which are generally uh, children on foot, poor people as well, but those who have suffered from the accidents. So, you know, the spirit of the meeting here is good. But my question is, at the end, how are we going to get this into the heads of the people who make the decision? Because it's very, very difficult. Uh, and uh, there's not really a credible argument against what we're saying. So we're not going to take any notice. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Um, um, John, you had a point to make? Yes. Um, 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 you were saying say something as well. it's spread far and wide. The Silvertown, um, I reckon it's going to have quite a lot of generation traffic, unless they told it all the way, as I've explained in the three scenarios. Is that sort of alignment? All the people down here are going to get 
generated traffic going up to all the people yeah. up there as well, as, as, well as, as, as well as the main radial yeah. direction. Yeah. So you're yeah, absolutely right. I think I think is back a... to this evidence that roads don't relieve congestion. They move it around, but, but more traffic is. It, it is going to be congestion. worse overall congestion. And I recognise, as a politician, you've got a problem selling that. Because all the logic says, widen the road, congestion should go away. There's so much evidence to show it doesn't. And there's so little evidence to show the traditional civil engineer's argument. You provide more capacity, you relieve congestion. You, if there's really still some at the back... Um, certainly on the traffic aspect, there's a the Professor Phil Goodwin, who was one of the experts um, for our objector side on the Thames Gateway Bridge inquiry. Um, he's, he's written a piece um, that's there, and he's basically saying that every sort of six years, we all collectively forget about how roads generate traffic. It has to be reproved and re, re remembered. <laughs> so if there's any at the back there, otherwise, do contact me and I can send it to you. But it, that certainly talks about traffic generation. I can't remember how much. It talks about um, actual congestion, um, and the other the other thing I just wanted to say briefly was absolutely, Barry. We, we worked with thousands of people um, on on the on the uh, south side of the Thames Gateway Bridge. You know, these Bexley, you know, uh, came became objectors. There was a huge groundswell of people who would have had very much worse traffic in all sorts of local roads. And these were people who changed their political allegiance to vote for MPs, councils, um, in all sorts of ways to get people who were anti-bridge. They got they changed an MP from a pro-bridge Labour to an anti-bridge <coughs> Tory. They changed their council. Who was the pro-bridge Labour MP? Um, I can't changed? remember his name, but I can't remember his name. It's in my. It's in my. I've, I've got a briefing. I can I send you. Nigel I, I, no, I think it was in Bexley. I think it was Nigel Beard. Uh, yes, well, that was it. Know, yes. He subsequently was France, yeah. so she yes. Was yeah. Sorry, I, did I say Greenwich? I meant Bexley. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Th this is on the border. So this there was it was um, yeah a, a, a pro pro bridge Labour um, Bexley MP. Um, so um, yeah, I think overall it's desperately sad that. People, you know, I think people, some people really genuinely do think it's going to help. They do genuinely think it might help congestion. They do genuinely think these sort of things will help, help um, regeneration. You know, and so it is just that it's rather outdated um, thinking. You know, the evidence is now that things get worse when we do things that we think we're going to try and make things better the, with. There's so. evidence how not to plan a city. I've yeah. never been to Los Angeles. I'm going there in April. But yeah. But, but it, it's apparently the archetypal lesson on how not to plan a city. It gets congestion that London never gets. Yeah. It's built over an area about the size of South East England. And with the same yeah, population of London. Yeah, and 7% yeah. of the downtown, according to the statistic, 7% of useful land in central, uh, of land in central Los Angeles is used for useful land use. 93% is used for motor cars. In central yeah. London, it's only about... It's still 25% is yeah. used for road space. And, and the point about regeneration is that if you have road sort of traffic-based regeneration, you get more spread-out type of yep. uh, development, low, low employment uses, low, mm -hmm. low density like warehousing, um, that sort of thing. And you've got Whereas, to provide all the extra car parking. And you've got to find you know, space, <laughs> space for the streets and the car parking, although some of them could be under. But generally... You know, it, to make a more compact city, you need it to be public transport based and um, yeah. orientated, walking and cycling. Public cities are far easier to provide public transport for. Yeah, they, they become it becomes symbiotic. Yeah. yeah, and also cycling. Obviously, the more the more we get traffic off the roads, then the more it's safer to cycle, and the more it's healthier to cycle mm -hmm. and walk, and which in turn should encourage more people to cycle. So that becomes a virtuous circle cycle, whereas the traffic becomes a you know destructive one into a black hole. No, who 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 has 
a question. Lady over there and Mary. Sorry, actually, Mary first. I beg your pardon. We're, we're, we're just over time. You're all welcome to stay. I don't know when they're going to throw me out, um, how long I paid for, but let's, let's, let's carry on while we can. Mary. Um, I don't know, Sam, I felt rather embarrassed by this, as you've been saying, the council show leadership. I'm the councillor for one of the provincial board, and clearly not a leader, although the leader is well aware of my views on this. I was only going to make some fairly low level points, really. One about the Jubilee line and the. It, oh, yes, I mean, I, my previous incarnation when I was working for a campaign organisation, I mean, that was one of the things we wanted, but all your traffic experts said, oh, no, 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 we don't want a station down at North Bridge, no one would ever use it. <laughs> which is finally finished with the traffic experts on us. <laughs> um, the low-level points I was going to make, which really are just about the peninsula, because that is, of course, my responsibility. I am concerned about either environmental issues, I mean some livability issues, and another big road going through, cutting off many village from everybody else, various other issues, which I don't think anybody else has or will raise, actually. Um... The other thing which I would very much appreciate um, traffic experts' views on is um, there are calls from the new populations coming from the peninsula for particular foot crossing at Blackmoor, which I'm not sure about. It's quite a long way. If you start walking it, it's a long way. That one? The, there's been a proposal, I think, from yes, Sustrans for one see, across that one. That they think you would have reached. They're not allowed for navigation. Issues. Yes. Um, I would also sign for yeah. as well. And, uh, well, of course, we do have the cable car, and I would be interested in any comments on that. Well, um, I don't know if you've got any particular aspects of that. I mean, I, I supported the principle of the cable car, as I say, in principle. It was one of... Mary? Oh, sorry. I was just thinking about the cable car. Um, that was... When, when, we, um, when the inspector came out against the Thames Gateway Bridge, um, I helped to organise a, a report about alternatives to that, commissioned by Professor Phil, um, written by Professor Phil Goodwin, Professor John Whiteleg and Hans Klass, who you probably know. Um, and the top thing that came out of that was a cable car um, and a, a sort of multi-stop fast ferry was the other thing. So, you know, and, but they were restricted to looking at the location down here at the Thames, um, at, at the, at the Thames Gateway Bridge location. And, and what the mayor has done is put it in here, which um, I think the big issue people say is that, you know, the, the, the cost, and it hasn't been incorporated into the travel card, plus it was designed to fit around going into Excel. And obviously it, it, it excelled at the time of the Olympics when there were two Olympic venues here. But I had to object in... in in, in detail because it crosses the line of City Airport which um, we were not satisfied was adequately safe safe um, um, for but I don't know if you've got any issues on that but do, do say so how and where you could put this across in which cyclists would yeah. use and which would be easily walked I mean not yeah. a great well there are two cars um, yeah, just before people go, I would just say uh, you probably won't, but do do f do fill in the response, everyone, to the to the um, to the to the, to the TFL answer, consultation. Yeah. Um, certainly, some would cycle to Docklands every day. The foot tunnel is in the wrong place if you want to get yeah. quickly up into East London. Well, you know, a walking, cycling only, or a walking, cycling, and public light public transport crossings, even if they were high, are much cheaper than um, anyone that has to carry general traffic. Yeah. Um, and you could um, do a, you know, uh, another <laughs> foot, foot and cycling tunnel under here. I can't remember the Sustrans one, whether it's an over or under idea, but, you know, all of those it, things it, are possible. It's a, a plan for East London development. Think yeah. Land use and planning is... <laughs> and what they've done is they've, they've suddenly this half... Two thirds of the way through the consultation, there's suddenly a couple of other options being <laughs> been thrown in. One of which was looking at the DLR along this southern approach, and the other was um, tolling these on their own without a new crossing. But they haven't looked at a proper package of combination of measures of some of these things and how they could be added together as a proper package. I would say. Gross up uh, top Yeah. Um, who there was this lady there? So sorry. Subjects, but I'd like to discuss with those who 
Uh, I'd like to wish our local MP a happy birthday today. And I think the present we can do things is to suggest he retires. <laughs> because he is the local MP of the construction industry. Yeah. <laughs> he advocates the construction industry. He was in all those uh, bridge the gap poses. And I'm pretty sick. In fact, I can't believe what I went to last month. But I'm pretty sick of having my MP for whom I should be voting, who I should be supporting, in basic principles, being the MP for the construction industry. <coughs> I vote for his birthday today. He really ought to retire and get some of his support system. <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. Someone asked what we can do. Yes. And there's several different things you could do. Yes. Your question, what can we do about it? First, first of all, we can lobby our councillors as yep. well as our MP. Yeah. Secondly, we can write to the press. Yes. Um, I should say, I declare an interest here as an editor of the Western News. We've got a, the, the issue that's coming out tomorrow is actually on this, mainly focuses on, <coughs> on this panel. And, and thirdly, um, um, tell our friends about the various petitions going around. Yeah. There's an 853 blog. Yeah. Which has got a petition there. For the Silver Tunnel. Maybe your yep. friends of the Earth have one too. Okay, so I was going to get on to some of these things. I think, I think what some of us can do is help spread the word in our individual communities and in individual estates. So I've got a list at the back. If anybody wants to sort of sign up to that, we can get in touch afterwards and try and work out. We may even have like a, a second sort of smaller sort of like planning meeting um, to how to take this forward with some, some sort of, you know, key local people. Um, because I think we, you know, we need to reach out. But it's only in the, in the immediate term. This consultation ends on Friday. Um, so I think you should um, definitely respond whatever your views um, I personally encourage you to object to both crossings not just the silver town Daryl has got a fantastic um, really useful campaign and, and petition against the silver town which I urge you to sign um, I, I would um, yeah um, I think there are <laughs> those are probably the main things oh also um, as I say, I, I work for Friends of the Earth now, but I came from running the Friends of the Earth local group, and it was called Greenwich and Lewish and Friends of the Earth, and we're actually now going to sort of separate the two. So um, if anybody would be interested in um, helping um, or just, just get some information about possibly getting involved with a Greenwich Friends of the Earth group, um, there's another thing to sign there, and then we could have a discussion about, um, about that. Just if you might, you know, not to join, but just some information about which you might think about joining. Um, and, yeah, I think, I think we have, you know, this is, this is a start. Um, there, is a, there is a debate, um, and the evidence has to get out there. I mean, you know, I think we, we see what the next stage is, but, um, you know, the chances... I have to say that the last consultation <coughs> that we had in the spring, I, my response to that said, basically, no results that apparently showed support for the scheme.